Greetings, friends. It's another wonderful day that God has given us. And today, uh, I'm just glad to be able to, to, to teach on this series, which is Discipling and Serving Others. Today is a little bit different because we uh, move slightly out of the book of John and talk about a principle. If I was just like to write it down in my own simple words, it would be the word press repeat. Like all that we have taught from week one, which is Jesus helping us to see from the book of John, <clears throat> that discipleship begins with an invitation to friendship, an invitation to relationship. And then we move from that week to see how Jesus is calling us to be worshipers of God. Like we cannot just be friends of God. We are also worshipers of God in spirit and in truth. And then how we help others worship God or gather others to worship God. It's my work as a disciple who disciples others to gather disciples of God to worship God. And then on the third week, we talked about a disciple as a servant. <clears throat> and we saw the principle of serving others and Jesus saying, if I as your Lord and your teacher is serving you and is washing your feet, go ahead and do that for others. And he says, that's like a command, go and serve. And we saw a wonderful picture of if we're going to love people, if we're going to uh, disciple people, we are called to live a life of serving them. And it's an attitude and a posture of the heart where we don't come expecting to be served, but we expect to serve others. And it's great, it's like outdoing one another in acts of service. And then on the fourth week, we saw the principle that a disciple is a witness. And the principle there in broad words was, we are to live a sent life. The attitude of the heart is that I am a sent person. I am sent by Jesus. I represent Jesus. And that I carry a message. And that message is what we call the gospel. It's the good news of God's love to a world that truly needs the love of God. And that we carry that and that it's God who saves people. All we need to do is carry that message as sent out ones. We have a purpose. We're not on earth just to count the number of days and to live. We are on earth as sent out missionaries of God to help people find and follow Jesus. And by doing so, they find life and fulfillment. Now, if we were to teach week five, uh, which is today, and, and we were to just really give it the right frame, we would say, press repeat. This is not just something that we go through. This is something that we keep doing, and it becomes the pattern of our lives. And that's why this week is the week on training. You see, this week, we're going to use the metaphor of an athlete, and athletes uh, are not just taught something for one particular race. They're taught a lifestyle. And that's what I like about the Bible. The Bible does not make things hard for us to understand. And when it starts to get to feel like, hey, that's spiritual, we don't get it. The Bible does something. He takes from what is known 
to explain to us what we perceive to be unknown. And so the Bible takes the language of, 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 of running and boxing and the things that we're familiar with, the Olympic Games that we're familiar with, and brings it down to our level so that we can receive the truth in ways that we understand it. <clears throat> and so a disciple is like an athlete who not only learns the principles, puts them into practice, begins to see the results for which they have been working on, and then the coach says something, press repeat. You're not just going to do it for once. You're going to do it over and over until it becomes a language that you fluently speak. You see, again, like language, if you don't use a language, you forget it. You become rusty. You can't speak it anymore. And so the thing about discipling others is, I just don't disciple one person and say, I've done my bit. Thank you, Lord. It's that we keep this as a pattern of our living. We keep the pattern of inviting people to friendship and us growing as friends of God. We keep the pattern of, uh, of serving others. We keep the pattern of living as sent out ones. And we continue on in this, and we become better at this language. So if you met me last year, you find out that I am better today because this is my way of life. And now I can confidently call people to my way of life. It's not just my way of life. It's because I imitate Jesus. People can see that I consistently, year in, year out, I'm living this life. Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy is a disciple of Paul. Timothy is a, like a, a spiritual son to Paul. And for some of you not familiar with those words, it really just as you the word. Timothy is a disciple, a learner, a lifelong learner of Paul, and he follows Paul and learns from Paul and is attracted to Paul's way of living and to Paul's teaching. And so Paul has commissioned Timothy at his young age of between 25 and 28. He has commissioned Timothy and to be the bishop of Ephesus to take care of the churches around Ephesus. And is writing to him as a young leader and saying, 1 Timothy 4, 7, says, Have nothing to do with godless myth and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. If there's any advice I would give you, Timothy, my disciple, my son in the faith, he says, Get rid of godless myth. Like there are things in our lives we need to get rid of. The kind of talk that does not benefit my spiritual man or my way of living. It does not generate love in my heart for others. There are things like old wife tales, like things that people say and have held on as tradition that are completely useless to the life of a follower of Jesus. He says, hey, get rid of that. Have nothing to do with it. Rather, he says, this is what you're going to give yourself to. Train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. The principle here is, Train yourself for godliness. Keep growing in the knowledge and in the grace of Christ. That's the principle. Keep growing in the knowledge and in the grace of Christ. Like you never stop growing as a disciple of Jesus. You need to keep growing in your knowledge of God and in the grace of Christ, which means you become more and more and more and more like Jesus. If I was loving 40% last year, I'm loving 60% this year. I'm loving 80%. I'm loving 100% as I keep growing in that area of grace. If I was a critical person last year 
I'm starting to appreciate everything around me and just to look at the good side of things around me and to say, God, thank you for making me who you have made me and for bringing me into this space and for giving me the people around me. I'm becoming thankful and grateful as I go. You see, friends, I, I do this all the time with my children, with the environment that we live in. I say you need to train yourself to see things. I heard of a saying back in the years that if you lived next to a dump, dumping site or a dumping ground, <clears throat> that soon enough that smell will become, from, uh, will, not beca will become a good smell, like it will be easy for you to live there and not notice that it was stinking. And, and until someone who does not live in that area would come into that area and say, hey, this place is stinking, and it would then call you to attention to realize you actually live next to a dump. And some of us are like that when it comes to our faith and our life, is that we allow some of these old wife tales and godless chatter and myths to fill our lives and we become familiar with those things unless uh, uh, accustomed and familiar with the things of God, the true riches of God. We have trained ourselves for ungodliness. And friends, the world is littered with ungodliness and it continues to train us to become godless and godless and then darkness checks in. And so the point of this week and the principle of this week is that my growth as a disciple of Jesus is my prerogative and it is my initiative. I need to take initiative to grow as a disciple. God's not going to come from heaven and make me grow. My neighbors are going to make me grow. It is up to me to grow in godliness. And that's the point of this week. It is my initiative to grow in godliness. It depends on me and my lifestyle if I'm going to grow in godliness. And like my children, I train them to see that this place is dirty. And then we clean it. And then I show them, do you see the difference between the clean surface and a dirty surface? Because sometimes we live in a place where we begin to forget that it is dirty because we don't clean it. And we begin to get used to it. It happens with sin. Or you start, you know, uh, being, compromising in one way or another. You compromise on, on, on paying something, like you don't pay it in full and or you compromise on not saying some things accurately. And, and then it becomes normal because you have allowed it over and over. You have trained yourself and you created a pattern of lying and now it becomes normal to you. I'm calling us today to create a life-giving pattern of godly living. And I'm going to break it down for us. So it's a personal initiative. Why is that important? Why is training important? And like it's, there's a saying that says, if we stay ready, we don't have to be ready. I'll say that again. If we stay ready, we don't have to get ready. You see, friends, the Bible says, be watchful, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, waiting for someone that he may devour. So if we stay ready, we don't have to be ready. It's like those five women who did not prepare themselves for the coming of the bridegroom. And so they had to leave the camp to go find fuel for their lamps. Because if we stay ready, we don't have to be ready. You see, friends, you do not know at what point your spiritual reserves will be called to action. You need to continue to grow so that you're always ready. And that's why Paul is writing to Timothy, says, uses the word train yourself. 
Because training requires every day showing up to do it and to give yourself to that same regimen or that same regime, same pattern, same rhythm, so that you get something out of it. In week two, when we talked about disciples as worshipers, we say a disciple is one who looks up to God and that we become what we behold. I say to you this day also that we become what we train for. So we will not just dream of transformation. We will not just pray for transformation. We will train for transformation. We train for transformation. What we, wa- we are to be, which is godliness, to be godly, we train for godliness. We train. So when you say someone's godly, someone's a disciple of Jesus, it means there's been something they've been investing it over and over and over. They've been investing in that area of their life, and now it begins to show. They were ready. They were staying ready every day. And now they don't need to prove a point to you. They don't need to go pray 10 hours to be able to speak to a situation. Because they've always been consistent in their relationship with God. Consistent in their walk with God. Consistent in their love for people. Consistent in their giving consistent in their generosity. They've always been training themselves to be godly. They don't need to be godly in the moment because they've always been training for that. Take responsibility, friends, for your spiritual journey. Lay structures, rearrange priorities, and embrace the proper habits of a disciple of Jesus. Embrace the proper habits of a disciple of Jesus. Some of you have read books like Atomic Habits. Uh, you've, You've read different books that talk about habits. And the principle around those books has always been that consistency in healthy habits makes it a pattern that becomes ingrained in you so that you naturally then do those things without having to think about them. I like in the area of money, for example, that we train ourselves to save. And so as you save, the little that you save, it becomes a pattern of life of saving, and then you now become better at that. When you think of the spiritual things, what are some of those spiritual reserves that you believe you need to save on? For example, the knowledge of who God is and his word. If you do not know what God says, at the moment of need, what will you quote and say? It is God's word or God's will. Jesus, when he's tempted by the enemy, speaks the word of God because the word of God is hidden in him. The psalmist writing in Psalm 119, it says, How can a young man stay pure? He says, by meditating on God's word or by memorizing God's word or, play, or, or storing God's word in his heart. How do you store God's word in your heart? By reading it consistently and meditatively and storing it in your heart. If you don't have the word of God, how will you know the will of God for a particular situation? And how can you pray the will of God? And that's what the Bible says that we pray amiss because we don't know the will of God for that particular thing. And so we sometimes we pray and no prayer is answered and some of our prayers are not answered because we have no idea what the will of God for that particular thing is. Train yourself. Take responsibility. Lay up structures. Rearrange your priorities to be in line with what you want to be a disciple of Jesus. And then embrace the proper habits of a disciple of Jesus. As if that's not enough, we see Jesus helping us with that pattern. And so we see Jesus himself, the God of the universe, the Son of the Most High God. He does something every day without fail 
He spends time with the Father daily without fail. I say to myself, I'm just a human being. Oh, mortal man, you are Tobias. And I still tell myself how I should excuse myself from following Jesus at some point in my life. I tell myself how I'm so tired today and I should not pick up that Bible. And I'm not saying tiredness should be ignored. No, if you're tired, sometimes it's healthy to just lay your head down. But what brought me to that tiredness? Maybe I just disregarded the moments when I needed to spend time with Jesus. And so we see Jesus in the morning, he would spend time with Jesus, with God. And in the evening while everyone else is gone, he would go up on the mountain and he would spend time with God. We see Jesus completely dedicated and committed to his father. And when he says this word, he says, I am about my father's business. I want to ask you today, as you lay priorities, as you take responsibility, as you lay structures and rearrange your priorities, and as you embrace those proper habits so that you can live the life of a disciple of Jesus, as you train for godliness, I want to ask you this one question. What are some of the patterns you have laid for yourself? Because it just doesn't happen. It happens for those who have laid a pattern. I love these words from John Wimber. And he said, When we pray, coincidence happens. When we don't pray, nothing happens. And he was talking broadly about what they noticed, that when they pray, somehow, somehow, God used to give them miracles. When they don't pray, nothing happened. And I want to ask you, is it a coincidence that some people tend to see more of what God has promised in his word and some people not? Could it be related to their training for godliness? Could it be related that they have trained their eyes to see things in the word of God by reading it? As the Bible says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things in your law. Is it coincidence that they see miracles and some of us don't? Maybe because we don't know who the Father is. And how do you know him? How do you speak his language? By consistency and creating a pattern and living a pattern, a healthy pattern of devotion. That's why we're calling you, friends, to stay ready and not, you will not need to be ready when you stay ready. Now, this is how I do it for myself and this is why I encourage you. How do you train yourself for godliness? One, I say, Bible, not book, pen is number one. Bible, notebook, and pen is number one. Every disciple of Jesus needs to embrace this practice of Bible, notebook, and pen. Let's begin with Bible. Is that daily, as much as I can, I will set a time when I will take the Bible and I will ask God, God, would you open my eyes to see wonderful things in your law? And then I will start reading. When I stop reading, notebook and pen, I will write down what I sense God is telling me that day. Some days it's just a simple observation. And we have tools we can give you. There's a tool called SOP, which is scripture, observation, application, and prayer. I say that scripture, which is scripture reading, observation, which is what am I seeing, what is this by portion written for? Who is it directed to? What am I seeing? Some of the hard words I need to look up. And then application. How is this relevant to my life today? And then prayer. Asking God based on what you have applied or understood from God's word to help you. So I have that scripture notebook and pen. And I write down. On my notebook, I also write down my prayers. Some of the things that I'm trusting God for, the people I'm praying for that day, I write it down. 
Number one is scripture, notebook, and pen. And that is a consistent daily thing that you want to keep. A habit of hearing from God and writing down what you sense he's telling you. Over time, when you look at that notebook, you're able to say, God spoke to me these words in the, in the last one year and they've come to pass. How do you grow accustomed to the voice of God? By reading God's word. You train yourself to hear God's word, to know God's word, to know God's voice. You train yourself. That's what a disciple does. Number two, a consistent daily quiet life. And when I say quiet, is a time of listening to God so that spiritually speaking, God can speak to you. It's a time of solitude, alone with God. And I recommend that, highly recommend, not with people. There is a place for people and fellowship with people. I recommend a time of quiet and solitude with God. I recommend a time with the Father where you stand in awe of Him and just like, oh, I'm just going to be here and listen to what He's telling me. And sometimes I've done that several times in my life and nothing is said and it's still good because I know I'm in the presence of the holiest, holy of holy, the holiest God. I don't know how to describe him, but just I'm in the presence of the most high God. And I'm just going to be quiet and still. I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to say anything. And if he was gracious on that day to tell me something, I will be so happy and I'll write it down. Quiet time. Quiet time. Number three, as a way of training yourself to godliness, commitment to group learning. When you read the scriptures, especially Paul writing, talks about uh, one another. There's something about group learning which trains us not only to gain from others, but also to love others. And that's why we in this new season, we're saying, would it be great if every member of Restore was part of a small group? As a way of training themselves to group learning and, and, and a way of being in an ecosystem where they can grow in their love for one another. Serving one another. It's how we train ourselves to godliness. We train ourselves to love others by being in their presence and knowing them, knowing how they talk and what are some of the rumblings of their hearts and how we can come alongside them to know their pain and their joys and how we can be the hands of Jesus to them. Train yourself to godliness. Discipleship happens when it we take it upon ourselves to grow by training. It means that I will show up every day, even when the days I don't feel like. It means that I will develop a consistent, active prayer life. It means that I will study my Bible. It means that I will kill sin in my life. It means that I will confess sin and repent. It means that I will obey God's word when he says something. And finally, it means that I will serve others consistently. I will train myself unto godliness. Listen to what Paul writes about Timothy in 1 Corinthians 4.17. He says, for this reason I am sending you, Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. He will remind you of my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach them everywhere in every church. And I love that. Paul says, I have a way of life. I have trained myself and I have a way of life. And, and he says, I have passed on that way of life to Timothy. And when Timothy comes to you, he will tell you of my way of life. How can somebody even tell people of your way of life if they don't, they are not in 
proximity with you and I've not watched you. And, and it's not a pattern. If it's not a pattern, I cannot tell people. And that's why the beauty of training is it's a pattern of life that people can see and say, that's the way to live a victorious life is to train yourself unto godliness. Let's go back to those Sunday school children ministry days. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Simple as that. Read your Bible and pray every day. We could narrow it down to that. And press repeat. And press repeat. And train yourself and to godliness. And then begin to see transformation. We do not dream of transformation. We do not talk of transformation. We train for transformation. And so I, the writer of the Hebrews writes by saying, he says, meat is for those who have trained themselves Meat or solid food, as the Bible says there, is those who, by reason of use, which is another word of saying, by consistent using it, have trained their senses to be able to discern from good and bad. They are ready for solid food. Today, I want to encourage you, would you train for transformation and stop dreaming about it? Start training for it. Father, thank you that we get to become as we consistently look up to you and train ourselves in godliness. Father, it's not just human effort. I love the fact that you give us all spiritual resources to help us to get it done. I love that you remind us that we can train ourselves and that we can get rid of godless chatter, of, of, of all those myths that people lean on, and we can grow in godliness. So Father, as we head out, into a new season of, of teaching. May this truth and the revelation of God's word remain with us and may we live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Even so I So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all that you have given me, Jesus, be. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making wise. In the soul, I love surrender. Oh, you are breaking ground. You are breaking. Yeah.
So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine. 